The Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium presents a very special episode with Devorah Major, recorded live via Zoom on Sunday, November 1st, 2020. What I'm working on now, a book called Love in the Hunting Season. And uh, I picked out some of these poems since uh, we are almost at the election. So specifically because of this, this first one is called US Fire Alarm, USA Fire Alarm. The house is burning. We can smell its smoke. Sparks singe the curtains. Our eyes water as growing fires sizzle at our front and back doors. On the top floor, some of the residents are in a thick fog sleep. Others are trapped in a darkened basement. Straight back and frightened, I sit in the living room. I am not alone. The house is burning. The arsonists say they will rebuild the frame with our bones, glue together ashes for the wall. They have no need to replace the windows. I have a bucket of water at my feet. Where should I throw it? Thank you. And this is uh, called Executing Officer. Uh, and this so funny when you do that. There's so many coming so quickly, but this was specifically for George Floyd. When you pressed your knee firmly on his neck, when you felt him quiver, when he gargled out his inability to breathe, when he cried out to the one who birthed him, when you saw him as worthless, not unlike the man you had killed before, you didn't know how he would rise to haunt you. As his name was inscribed at the Sankofa wall of Ghana, his face emblazoned on doorways, on shirts, on billboards, you did not know the power of his spirit. You did not know how many the many children who would discover that the monsters they feared did not sleep under their beds, but walked the streets with badges and guns and looked like you. You did not know that you were creating a martyr, now known around the world as a man of love, a man of peace. You did not know that as your mask fell, many would see your true face deformed by hate. You did not realize that you would become a pariah as George rose up, becoming a torch blistering with a thunderous call for resistance until justice was served. You did not know that each sleep-torn night, your cell would be lit with the eternal fire of that torch. And what can I say about this next one? This is because it was like, and then I needed to write another poem and another poem and another poem, and I couldn't. Resisting Genocide. Everyone is writing poems about George Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor or Sandra Bland, Emmett Till or Amado Diallo, Trevon Martin or Oscar Grant, Ramarley Graham or Michael Brown or so many others. But I have been writing poems about black people murdered in the endlessly declared and undeclared wars of our times, dying while loved, dying while alone, dying while afraid, dying while besieged by enemy, dying while besieged by kin. I have been writing poems about black people dying for about as long as I have been writing poems. And as I sit here searching for the right words to pen, my mouth is slack, tears held back as the litany of words I have already scribed rolls out beneath me. And the only things that seem to have been changed are that more are dying, more black men, more black women, more black children, ever younger and more innocent, full of possibilities that too few seem able to see and more are killing each other for reasons even they cannot fully explain unreasoned rage confusion frustration and desire but the center of each of these poems is the same the killing of and death of black people i already have stacks of poems with sharp 
tipped blades cutting my heart. Black people are killed without mercy or remorse, without fear of penalty. One black person every 28 hours falls from a police officer, security officer, vigilante, while another 8,000 die each year from killing each other. Each of these murders killing our line, ending our future. So I write this poem for the living who we need to offer more than cautionary advice. Say yes, sir, on demand. Keep your hands up and open. Stay aware and remember that you are a hunted target, always under siege, prejudged as criminal, wrong on account of color, wrong on account of neighborhood, wrong on account of clothes, wrong on account of music, wrong on account of birth. We need to make a new way for all of them to stride with their smiles, lighting up dark corners as their neighbors watch out for the treasure of their inner beauty and the caprice of their outer style and the endless potential of their precious lives. So, um, Moving on, I think. To, uh, so I got really interested. I was writing COVID poems about COVID-19. And then I was like, wait a minute. How many pandemics do I know of? And I knew of, I knew of the Spanish uh, flu because my um, great-grandfather and great-grandmother and two great-uncles died in that flu. So it was very personal to me. And of course, uh, SARS and, you know, I knew of some, but I decided to look it up. So this is called Pandemic Times. What I discovered was uh, almost every plague has been spread by me. Uh, and so I start with George Santayana, I don't know how to say his name, Santayana's quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Where in one does one start counting? These viral death killers have ravished the people in circled funeral pyres, covered our lands with sickness, scars, and treacherous death. Before Torah, Bible, Koran, scripture, before Bhagavad Gita and Ifa teachings, before Buddha meditations, viruses awoke, flourished as they killed, and then slept for a time while reinventing themselves. But in these most recent 2000 years, they have advanced their pace as they learn to sojourn through the ragged seas of human war and insistence on dominion. The Antonine Plague opened our first calendar millennia, spread by the Huns who fought for bounty land and servitude. The plague of Justinian halved that first thousand years with rats inadvertently shipped to Constantinople in tribute seized from the recently defeated Egypt. Our second millennia strong has turned to children's song that ring around the rosy plague named Black and Terror, which was spread by fleas on rats on ships returned from the fa failed crusades. A hundred years later, in lands renamed the Americas, smallpox was draped on blankets and brandished as an act of war against all indigenous souls. And near the end of that fevered thousand years, British soldiers spread cholera throughout the world as they conquered and colonized. And last century, again, conscripted soldiers carried a virus to Spain, where it was given a name before it traveled west, landing across the Atlantic. And now in this third millennia, as its first century breaks and wars simmer and boil across every land, a virus comes again. This one perhaps gleaned from animals and developed in the quiet life laboratories of biohazard research, becoming a wide shot weapon, not easily controlled, no continent unscathed, millions dead and dying. And as we fear each other, we sicken and millions could die. Have we learned anything? Are we learning? 
I kind of didn't know how to end that because I don't know, <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyway, I'm convinced actually there was a medical lab in Wuhan and there was one in Maryland. And what they both had in common was that the Chinese and the Americans were working on some bio research involving bats. So that's why I had that verse in there, you know. I'm kind of required about the Americans. This is down pressure. I'm not, <laughs> I should have brought some water so I can't sing the Bob Marley line like I love to. Woe to the down pressers, they'll eat the bread of sorrow. You walked on our bones for centuries, turned them to sand, poured into sand boxes for your children to build sand castles. And when the sand became translucent, filled with sunlight burning your eyes, you found more to sacrifice, sent vultures to strip away our skins and build ladders formed from our ribs, limbs, and skulls on which you climbed to get a better view of the lands you planned to conquer. And now we rise joined by some of your children and grandchildren who have eaten of shame and refused to travel on the rails you laid with our bones. And each of you who blocks our path, tries to press us back, will be blinded by our brilliance. Blinded, blinded, blinded by our brilliance. Uh. Yeah, I put this in because I knew I'd be exhausted after this, all of those. <laughs> this is called writing love. <clears throat> all I want to write are love poems. In this season of rotting flesh and hollow bellies, in this year of hidden corpses and shrapnel graveyards, all I want to write a love poems to the one whose breath will mix with mine for the lips I will taste, for the hips I will encircle, for the sap I will share. All I want to write a love poems about shining eyes and sweats perfume, about promises made and kept, about secrets and fears shared and revealed. In this year of the buried city, this decade of the hunger crop, this century newly begun yet already with thousands upon thousands of limbs torn off, eyes burnt out, hearts eviscerated, all I want to write are love poems. I don't want this job of recording the children's despair, the mother's grieving, the father's misery, the son's brutalization, the planet's storms and fires. It's all too much for me. My eyes filled with salt and become blurred, and the only love poems will make it better, will clear the way. But all around me, these others who I love in knowing and as strangers are being murdered or enslaved, starved or tortured, imprisoned or forsaken. And the poems I want to write evade me until I am left with nothing but this howl wedged between my teeth. All I want to write are love poems about blue kissing my morning's lemon tart and fresh flavoring my afternoons, crescent moons arching away from Venus's sparkle in a star-hungry sky. All I want to write are love poems. All I want to write is love. Ah, oh, which is true. That would be so great if I could just... I mean, it would be not just people love, the planet love, the stars love, love of my children love. I mean, there's so many loves, but you know, I could definitely do a whole universe of love poems. I heard this woman that was doing Amharic translations of the Bible. And uh, she did a couple of translations that fascinated me. And one of them was from Who Shall Inherit the Earth? And so this poem came out of that, Who Shall Inherit the Earth? In Amharic, I once heard that the correct translation was not meek, broken, crushed, humiliated, low, who would inherit the earth, 
but the gentle. And we are inheriting the streets even as we sleep on them and are swept up only to return, sharp the edges of so many of our lives, fierce with hunger and pain, so much disillusionment and so very few triumphs. Even as the rulers squeeze tighter, cutting short our breath, hobbling our steps, harnessed together, we will inherit the earth, such as it is, sad with violence and pestilence, the air clotted and gray, islands covered with an ever-rising sea, turning, turning, still it is becoming ours. Even as they wage their gruesome wars, killing and selling, buying and exporting death, advertising the price for each kill, factored into the decision to research, develop, manufacture, and buy the newest weapon to kill more quickly, more anonymously, even in the face of this hegemony of arms, every side buys from every side. Every side sells to every side. Even the pawns choose their weapons, aim and fire and die. Still, we gentle are joining together more and more tightly, inheriting the earth from these others who want only to have to owe to own, to control, as if they were hurricane and sun, arrogant in their perceived power, not understanding that all of it will explode or else disintegrate it, and they will be left with misshapen, impotent stories of the times that used to be, while we remain, remembering our many losses along the way, still wounded and reeling, we, gentle, will inherit the earth and pull out our seed stock and begin to plant anew. And I am actually going to end with this because I think, oh, I do have some more time. Do I have more time? Okay, let me go a different way. I do yes, Laura, to... you've, got, you've got a goodly amount of time, so take your time. Okay, wonderful. Let me go back to one of these, even though it's difficult. I am so in love with my uh, son, and uh, he's just incredible. But when I wrote this poem, there was a young man named Shaka Sanko, uh, I believe that's his name, I have it written down, so I'll be sure. Uh, and he was getting ready to be executed, and they did execute him. And he was, um, he had committed a crime when he was 17 years old. And they had, they know scientifically that the male brain, sorry guys, that the male brain does not mature until the age between 21 and 25. So any young man, particularly under 21, it's not that you don't have to, there shouldn't be repercussions and, you know, uh, consequences, but the consequence should, should not be death for an act done an impulse act, which that was, bad impulse, whatever. That's the part of the brain that's not, anyway. So all I could think of was my son, he had two artists, his parents, and because of that, although there wasn't much money, rich in culture and cool people and all of this, and that's how he turned out so well. Uh, I mean, his dad and I had a lot to do with it, but frankly, the community that we were surrounded by had every bit as much to do with it. You know, they really developed it. And I thought about Shaka Sankofo and other young men like him, and what did they have? And so this poem came out of those two impulses. I watched my son move into manhood. The music video slant and at last year's step translated to a wider strone that intones his name, man of good character. He saunters with more than sinews and bones. My son makes his own oxygen when the air is my son makes his own air when the oxygen is in short supply. My son is blood of purpose, heart of resolve, lips of laughter. He calculates, computes, splits ideas, delineates, assesses, adds and subtracts, recombines the moments of his days and moves forward. My son has never been beaten until his brain scabbed or been trapped in a childhood of bruising injustice. My son was not produced inside frosted crack 
pipes, seeking a mother, constantly disappearing in wisps of acrid smoke. He was not chased into closets, under beds, down dark alleys, by large-fisted, black-booted men disguised as fathers or uncles or friends. I watched my son unwrap his future like a child at a first birthday party, tearing apart the colorful paper, getting caught up in the string, not knowing what to play with first. Yet the brighter his glow, the more I see these other boys, these children still who would be men, who pace in chains and shaved head around a future that makes bowels liquid, ladders weak and faces contort as they add stars to the tattered flag that shines on this nation's affliction, their arms tied down and filled with vengeance's poison. My son sings his song each night. I listen to the notes that hold inside the cries of these boys who would have been men if given a robe, if offered a dream. And I do so believe that, that we just... We just don't get it. Uh, we just don't get it. So I've done a couple, but I'm going to do a few more from, uh, I didn't say which, from uh, Calafia's daughter. I think I'm going to um, uh, do this. Uh, well, this is one of my metaphysical ones. The, the shape of my body changes. Um, this is from... Uh, actually, this East Indian poet had these 14 questions. And I read her book, and frankly, I didn't care for it. But I thought the questions were very cool. <laughs> and one of them was, what is the shape of your body? The shape of my body changes. Not long ago, my body seemed formless, just a pulse and heat all flesh consumed in passion, my spirit spread out beyond the bones, through the blood, past the sweat, seeming to touch distant stars. Less than a week before that, I had fins but no gills or tail, suddenly sleek as I pulled through the tepid water, blue like the sky, cloudless and distant. Sometimes my body is bloated, too full of waste. It bulges here and pinches there, cluttered with snot and trivialities. Often it is round, able to go in many directions at the same time, a constant circle of being. And then at times my body is nothing but a racing heart. I'm oh, sorry, I lost my point but a racing heart, long elk legs darting to a deserted glen. One morning last month, it was long and thin, at certain angles hard to see, like the Sudanese woman belongings on her head, bright yellow and green caftan swaying in the dry wind as she, draped with hunger, leads her children through a war zone to a war zone. My body shifts and changes, but always caresses the air, enjoys the breath of stilled wind against breast or thigh through hair. My body remains a simply cast temple of love and forgiveness. I did. Uh, um, this is called uh, Creation Paradox, and I'm a lot of the poetry I'm working on, um, and several of the poems in Kalati's Children. I try to look at time, I look at the stars and the planets, but I also look at us through time because I think we, we, we you know, it's like everybody's getting their genome now to find out what their various ancestries are. Uh, I think there's some value in that because then maybe people will get we all are one, you know, <laughs> we are the world and all like that. But I think that within our genes, what we're missing is that there's genetic memory. There's things we 
know and we don't understand we know them because there's a genetic memory too. So this is called creation paradox. We hold the great, great grandparents of our ancestors' grandparents in our bloodstreams, in our stomachs, in our hearts. Thousands of years rest inside our souls. In those years lives the record of our beginning. It is the sweetest marrow in our spine, the cleanest shine in our eyes, the open side of our laughter. You can read it in the lines on the soles of our feet. When we retell the stories of where we came from, we draw back tree branches to find hidden fruits which we savor, pointed thorns which make us bleed, the yesterdays that led to here, the here's that lead to tomorrow. When we go back to the beginning, we find the stars. In the beginning, there was a time, we all say, when we were not. After that time, we became. We were created. We were molded. We were spat out. We were sung into until we learned how to make, what to form, where to spit, why to sing. But once, long ago, in the beginning, there was only one and from that one others were born and out of those many came us. That is the story we all tell. But before that beginning, before the in the beginning, when we were born, there must have been another beginning. Before the spider crafting web laying 16 eggs, before the mountain birthing lovers birthing children, before the sky settling low to mate with earth, before light, before darkness, before breath even, there must have been another beginning. And it is said that it is in that beginning, in the beginning before our beginning, it is there that you must go if you want to find the faces of God thousands of years thousands and thousands of years rest inside our souls. So, and I am going to do uh, one last poem, which is also from uh, Calithia's daughter, to say, for those of you that don't know, I have a, whole, a poem on it, or a poem in her voice, and things, but Calithia is the... Uh, African Amazon queen that was written of in a book uh, in the 1500s that Cortez was reading and it spoke of black African Amazon queen named Calithia who lived on an island with lots of gold and uh, um, thick rocky cliffs. Uh, and so when he got to uh, California, he thought that's where he was. A third of his crew was also Africans and one of them was an interpreter. So he was sure this would be full of black people and it was the land of the Nick Queen Caliphate. And that is why California has its name. Uh, but unless you go to the Mark Hopkins Hotel and look at their mark, their <laughs> thing, or buy my book, which has the Mark Hopkins black Caliphate on the front in this incredible, incredible, I'm sorry, all my stuff. Oh, no. Isn't that beautiful? That's actually by a California ceramicist, that image. I did not know her, but my publisher in Detroit did. Or she looked up Califia images or something. Anyway, so this last one, this is called Stardust. And this was, again, from, I, I hear all these, this was from a cosmologist gave me this information and I couldn't leave it without doing the poem, Stardust. Out of clay they caution, dust to dust they intone. From earth you came and to earth you will return, they admonish. They remind us we are mortal and subject to death, yet insist on their eternals, demons and angels, paradise or purgatory, merely human with a finite number of days, but we have exploded as novas, 
earned through galaxies, explored far reaches of the Milky Way, ridden on the tail of comets, danced on the edge of asteroids, until in a dizzying frenzy of passion we fell through the viscous ozone, past cooling clouds to settle in the ooze that feeds the ocean's floor. It was there that we decided to grow limbs and tongue, all the while holding inside the truth of our origins, magnesium, copper, calcium, iron. We are the stuff that stars are made of. Mm. It's a scientific fact, a cosmic trust in ignorance and in knowing. We hold grains of the divine inside ourselves. Stardust. I thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you, Devora. Thank you. I, uh, I love that last line. We are the stuff that stars are made of. It's just, it's so true. And in fact, through all of what you read for us, some things struck out, have stu stuck out for me. One is clearly these days, I think all of us more perhaps than other times, all we want to do is to write love poems. Um, you know, we've been starved of that ability. And, uh, Thank you for reminding us of that. And thank you, too, for um, the image of your son uh, unwrapping his future like a little boy at a first birthday party. Um, it just, there were these rays of hope that you gave us today and for which, you know, we thank you very much uh, as we move through these times. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I just feel like that's one of the things I've set myself to do, even if there's a downside to the poem, to make it hopeful. I do believe that the gentle will inherit the earth. I believe it will be a serious struggle. <laughs> uh, but as we become more of a corporatocracy worldwide, then guns will not be the issue. It will be people, and do we work or don't we work? Yeah. No, it's so right, and, and, and that you know, was, we can do it. Yeah, the gentle will inherit the earth, and um, and there's another phrase from out of the Old Testament: "What does the what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly?" And that's that goes along with being gentle, uh, gentle with life, with each other, with the planet. And uh, thank you for reminding us of that. And, you know, we didn't get a chance really to talk about you at the beginning of this. So I, I want to just remind everybody um, just how, and you saw it in the, in the flyer that was attached to the invitation, but Devorah is a really accomplished poet and performing artist. Uh, she was San Francisco's Poet Laureate uh, for four years. Uh, she's born and raised in uh, California. Uh, as we've just heard, she's not long back from Italy. Uh, and uh, out of that experience, um, uh, created her sixth book of poetry. Um, and uh, her seventh book, uh, Califia's Daughter, we've just heard from. Uh, and I love the story of Califia and how this island that they thought Baja was turned out not to be an island, but they gave it the name of Califia Ornia, California. Uh, and uh, that's where we are. Uh, Devorah has written five other books. She's been featured in a number of CDs. Uh, she's performed with Daughters of Yam, which is a poetry and jazz performance duo. Uh, and uh, her work, uh, Trade Roots, uh, was performed. It's a commissioned symphony that premiered under uh, Michael Morgan, the maestro of the uh, Oakland East Bay Symphony. Um, so she has really, um, really been involved in presenting herself and her work uh, not only through the, the, the reading of her poetry, but through the spoken word and, and word and through music. And she's participated in festivals, poetry festivals around the world. Uh, she's a gifted teacher, worked with California poets in the schools, uh, and did that a number of years ago. And, and for a while, she was uh, the executive director of that organization. Uh, and she's worked as a poet in residence at San Francisco's Fine Art Museums, which are magnificent museums. Uh, and currently, she's a part-time senior adjunct professor in critical ethnic studies and literature departments at California College for the Arts. 
And we were talking a little bit about that. Right now, that position involves the challenge of teaching remotely and online, uh, but she's accomplishing uh, what she needs to do there and reaching out to students in this country and also uh, in China. And so uh, we've, we've been treated to uh, a gift this afternoon uh, by a remarkable poet and performance artist. And Delora, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. My, my honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you. Uh, your website uh, is, uh, and it's in the flyer, www.devoramajor.com. I urge you to spend some time on there. It is, it's really a treat. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe this afternoon you can, um, before you go back to the rest of life, uh, wonder for a little bit in there. It's, it's just great reading and it's just a great experience. So thank you, Devora, very much. Um, and this was a special reading that we had. Uh, it's, it's appropriate um, to help boost our spirits and give us uh, energy and guidance as we go forward. And if we haven't done so, we all have an obligation on Tuesday to do something that's essential and important, which is to vote. And I would urge you please to do that. Um, and uh, uh, next time we get together, which will be a week from today, uh, the election will be over. Maybe the counting won't be over, um, but we'll hope that uh, the counting is able to continue, that it's not suppressed and uh, excluded and other bad things don't happen to it. Uh, and uh, uh, by that time, maybe things will be a little, a little bit brighter. Uh, we'll be able to write some love poems uh, as a result. Um, our next reading is Sunday, uh, the 8th uh, of November, via Zoom. Uh, Simon Hunt and Ed Jarvis will be um, uh, reading uh, for us uh, here, and uh, you'll receive uh, information in that regard. Um, please do stay in touch. We are on Facebook at Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium, uh, and if you're not joined uh, that Facebook page. It is no big deal. Just go there and hit the button and uh, you'll become part of the consortium. That's really all it takes. And so uh, thank you again all for being here. Devora, thank you. And uh, please continue your wonderful work. And uh, I hope that before too, too long, hopefully when the, the pandemic is over, uh, we'll have you back and maybe in person. Uh, it would be a pleasure. I love Monterey. I had to say this, especially for Jackie, because she met my father. On my website, I have the journey of the tapes. I taped my father during his last years and asked him questions. I've learned from transcribing the tapes. I'm a horrible interviewer, but there were enough nuggets there. And so I have pieces of the tapes and pictures of him from growing up. He was born in 1926. Wow. And so, and lived a lot and lived a real, his life is just unbelievable. I'm so glad I did that. But anyway, that's why my website is the journey. I, I just finished redacting the tapes a couple of months ago, but my life has been in quite a bit of turmoil. So I've been unable to really keep up with the site, but there's a lot there. But the journey of the tapes is one of the parts I'm most proud of. Well, so go there and check that out. And, and it, your dad, was it your dad's folks who died from the Spanish flu? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so it was. And so my grandmother, who was, my grandmother was left in Jamaica. And so she had, was flown to Canada where she was brought up by an aunt in Montreal. Wow. Yeah, yeah, because it was, yeah, because they left her because of her young age. And they went to Costa Rica because her father, you know, the, Jamaica was, you know, is a colonial, or, you know, thing. British colony. Yeah. yeah, and so during that time, and that was, you know, the early 1900s, her father worked for the British military and he was like a, a, a NCO level and they sent him to Costa Rica and uh, they get, that's where they got it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, as you say, they're not, I mean, there was Justinian's plague. There've been all these plagues, the, mm -hmm. the constant, that virus, as you said, is down there in the dark uh, doing its, uh, it's morphing and changing and coming back from time to time. Uh, and uh, that's what we're dealing with now. So. Yeah, and we need to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you all, and uh, uh, we appreciate you being here. Devorah, thank you, and uh, take good care, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you back here next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Al. Bye-bye. Bye, Devorah. Bye,